Um, today we're going to continue. Let me see. I see some other coming, but we today we're going to continue with the uh, chapter thirteen to finish, and also I'm going to do some exercising. So we we need to take like a break after I do the um, the lecture, basically explaining how we can identify molecules in the infrared spectroscopy. Then we take a uh, a, a little break, like for 10 minutes, and then we're going back again, okay, to do some exercising. I want to show you uh, different um, examples using um, um, using um, the uh, assignments uh, worksheet. Like I explained before, I just put it so you can have uh, another, um, like a, another examples to, to study for the test. Um, so I'm going to try to do some of them. I left another one that you can uh, review and then ask me questions in the other Zoom meeting or um, also during the lab because I mean, we are in the same um, schedule with the lab and the and the and the lecture, uh, but um, I want to uh, um, start today with the uh, part that we left. So basically, we stop here uh, when we discuss everything for the mass spec. Okay. Um, for the mass spec, I do some exercises in the during the uh, meeting in the lab. But if you have any questions, we can go back again in that area, okay? Just uh, let's wait in the second uh, section. And after I complete this area for the IR spectroscopy, and then we can go back again for the mass spectrometry and also doing some exercising for the IR, okay? Um, <clears throat> You have in your notes in the um, in the lecture one and two um, that we basically need to um, do uh, the calculation for the units of unsaturations. We saw something similar in orbital one, but we don't cover the whole thing about how we identify. I know. Uh, identify how many double bonds we can have. So using this kind of um, equation, we can uh, identify how many double bonds we can have in the molecule. So we need to make sure that we, when we look in the uh, molecular formula, identify if we have an halogen or if we have a nitrogen or if we have an oxygen. The oxygen doesn't affect any uh, values in the calculation for the uh, double bond, meaning the unsaturation in the molecule. But when we have nitrogen, nitrogen and any halogen like the chlorine, the bromium, iodine, and the fluorine, those make a little different, okay? So we need to subtract or add one value because it's placed by this uh, atoms, okay, in the uh, carbon bonding, okay. So using the values when the complete um, molecule is completely saturated, meaning that the uh, molecule, it will be an alkane that has the four uh, electron sharings for bonding is completely saturated with hydrogen. So we need to estimate based on the formula when we have a carbon that has any numbers, uh, we need to multiply the hydrogens by two and then add it to, okay? In order to see that the carbon, uh, because, oh, molecule here, okay. So I'm trying to assume that all the carbons that I have Mm -hmm. I mean, the white ones are my hydrogens, okay? So I'm trying to say, okay, this carbon is completely saturated. So all the electrons 
that is sharing, I know the molecular formula at some point they can tell me, hey, you have like a chlorine attached to it, to that carbon, but to make sure that I uh, have the saturated hydrogen's number, I need to assume that this carbon is attached to four hydrogens. So that's why I need to multiply by two and then add two, because at the end, remember the carbon when it's linked to one other ones, like this one. And let's see. This one. When it's linked like that, okay, you have one, two, three, and four. If you see in the screen, we have four carbons. Remember, each car is car each carbon in the center has two because it's bonded with another carbon in the line, but the one that are in the corners, they have three. So that's why we need to add two more in order to get completely saturated. What happened if I have one atom or one carbon, instead of having one hydrogen, I have like a chlorine, uh, let's use this thread like a chlorine or an halogen, okay? I need to use the same molecular uh, formula, but in the amount of hydrogens that is effective, I need to subtract the hydrogen that is supposed to be attached to that halogen, okay? In order to get the effective value, okay? So using that formula here in the bottom, I'm using the DBE and I have the hydrogen that is saturated Remember, it's using everything that has hydrogen. So instead of having, I know that my molecular formula is telling me that I have those, but I will ignore in order to get the saturated, okay? And after that, we need to use the effective, but because I have an halogen, I need to remove that hydrogen, okay? And then I divide it by two. Using that, it will tell me a number depends on how high is this number. It is between one and three. It can be a double bond in some areas, okay? Or it can be a triple bond, okay? Because remember, it's not saturated. So that's why we have double bonds or triple bonds. Also, if the number is more than four, it's meaning that you have, yeah, let's see one. is that you have a benzene ring. And remember, the benzene ring has double bonds, but it's three double bonds, okay? So that's why you have four because uh, it's missing um, those hydrogens. So you're missing these two hydrogens, the other two hydrogens, and the other two hydrogens. So that's why you get four at the end, okay? So using that, <clears throat> we can calculate how much is the uh, degrees of unsaturation, some books call, call like that, and some books say that is the double bond equivalent number, okay? That basically tells us how many double bonds are present because our uh, molecule, when we look in the molecular formula, we need to make sure it is saturated or not. The only way to see it is trying to do this calculation, which is a very quick and you see, we can do that and we can say, hey, it is zero, is everything single bonds. So I don't need to make sure that I have a double bond somewhere. So I can try to do my drawing for the final molecule using single bonds and then place uh, whatever hydrogen I have. And I have a halogen, uh, sorry, because it's zero. It is, uh, if I have an oxygen, which is, the one that is not making any difference in the calculation, I can place the hydrogen, uh, the oxygen, what is the location, okay? So that one, it helps me to see how I see my a molecule at the end, okay? Um, uh, one other technique we don't cover in the lab because we don't have the machines and it's very specific. Um, this one is called the gas chromatography, but usually 
what we do in this kind of machine is using different kind of methods for detecting at the end. So basically this uh, machine, the most common one, use the mass spec. So that's why we cover mass spec in the first class. So usually the detector, I mean the machine, is very similar to the machine that we have before. So we only, the only thing is that we have the magnet, but the only thing here is that we have a coil, very long coil, and that area here is, uh, I mean, is, is, is inside of a chamber. This chamber uh, increases the temperature at very high temperature, meaning like 100 degrees or 200 degrees in order to get the sample completely in a gas phase, okay? Once they get in a gas phase, they have a mobile media, okay? It's like a very long coil that has like a gel inside, which allow that uh, each um, segment or fragment move quickly, okay, depends on the molecular weight. So that's why we cover mass spec for that. And at the end, when they move, the different fragment is getting detected. So the only thing for that machine, which is a little different is this area here, because it's, this area is exactly in a chamber that increases the temperature. And then the, uh, the fragments for the sample, when they get um, they get fractionated, is getting detected, and then you get at the end your uh, mass spectra. Okay, so it's very similar. The only thing is that, and we will see peaks. So this one is the uh, peaks for the different fragments, and in this case is all based on time. So you need to know exactly how looks like uh, your sample or how looks like your um, your product. So you need to have samples for products and then, then samples for the, um, the reagents. And once you have those, you need to do like a curve line based on the different uh, concentrations. Then, with the retention times, you will be able to identify each of these peaks, okay? Um, that's the only thing of different. These retention times is depend on that fragment, how much is the mass, and once you have the mass, it's based on the uh, boiling point for that fraction. That basically you will see those uh, um, peaks showing up in the spectrum, okay? Uh, we don't do these uh, experiments on the lab because, I mean, we don't have those machines, but what is behind is basically covered in the mass spectroscopy because it's based on those uh, fragmentations for the sample, okay? Um, other thing that we need to cover is the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, based on the uh, frequencies, once we um, put energy on the sample in a different ways, meaning in heat or meaning on vibrations or meaning on uh, waves, we can see some kind of um, changes in the behavior for the different uh, molecules. Depends on the, uh, on the media that we uh, put energy for the uh, for the sample, we will see some um, um, some results. Those results it depends on the frequency that we use and also in the wavelength in order to see which kind of method we can use. Okay, um, based on the electromagnetic spectrum, we have different medias for the uh, energy to be transferred. Some of these media it can be a cosmic rays alpha rays, x-rays, uh, we have our area that is the visible light, we have the infrared radiation, so we have different ones. Uh, cover the visible light and ultraviolet, those, um, we have some machines that they can um, do the analysis for the sample, 
uh, we will see those later, but usually you will see something similar to the mass spec that we have some kind of curves and it depends here in the axis for um, the X axis based on the wavelengths, okay? So depends on the wavelengths that is in the ultraviolet light and the visible light, we can see some uh, peaks and we can identify those double bonds uh, or triple bonds if we have present those, okay? After that, the, um, I mean, after those uh, wavelengths exactly that is required, you don't see anything in the sample because it's, it's not so much energy required to have some kind of vibration or some kind of effect in the molecule. So that's why it's an, a specific wavelength that happens some kind of, of behavior depends on what kind of uh, molecule you have, if they have double bonds here, like, like this one that has a double bond, when they do those uh, changings or those kind of vibration, you will see that it's only uh, possible at some wavelength. After that, you don't see anything. So in that case, um, the uh, curve goes basically to zero or to the baseline and you don't see anything more, okay? So that is the only effect for those we need to know exactly what is the uh, final product, what is the initial product in order to identify those. Uh, in the infrared radiation, we have the same kind of thing. Depends on what we have in the molecule. If we have a carbonyl group, let me see if I have a carbonyl here. If we have a carbonyl group, I know some of you take the a course with me in the last, uh, the, the lab course in the last semester. We don't cover in full details, but like I say, in Elgo 2, we will cover. Um, those vibrations depends on how they uh, expand or they move. They can do bending like that. Um, they have different wavelengths. And you can identify those using the infrared radiation, okay? And the machine, it looks like this one. And what is happening is that you put the, uh, the sample inside. So you put the sample here in the compartment. And then you have the IR source that is has different uh, mirrors and it will be traveled that energy and pass through the sample. Okay, the sample is in a clear vial that allows us to have that uh, light coming through. And what is happening is that the energy that is receiving the sample is causing some kind of vibrations. So we have stretching vibrations and we have bending vibrations. So it depends on this, uh, how it's moving those atoms in the molecule. When we have a stretching, we have two types of stretching. So it can be symmetric or asymmetric. Or if we have bending vibration, we have four different ones, okay? Remember, we, we need to count every atom that we have and depends on what kind of functional group we have, we will see those vibrations based on the wavelength, okay? Because not all is showing at the same wavelength in order to be identified, okay? Um, so here, <clears throat> if we go in the book, we have different tables in the chapter 13. I know when we do the uh, lab, we try to use some chart that it was more, uh, um, more general, but here we can also use this kind of charts in order to identify those. And we saw the intensity depends on those when they say it is medium, they, that big, it doesn't go exactly go down that is in the spectra, that absorption burn doesn't go very, very low. So it goes exactly like in the middle, meaning, let me go over. It will be something like here. But when we have something like this one, this is a very strong 
uh, peak, okay? This absorption band is very, very strong. When we have something uh, small, it will be something like this one and this one that basically is, is more moderated, okay? So we have different um, wavelengths. Another thing that I want to uh, include here is the regions. When we have, uh, I want to see if I can have one more clear. Um, 60, 600, mostly all starting 600. Okay, let's let's do a, a comment here. Um, my pencil, okay. When we have the functional group region that goes for the, um, let's say, yes, for this one, 1400 to 400. So it will go something here, okay? So they go in 400. That is the, um, the functional group region. When we want to see the fingerprint region is for the 1400 to 1, from here to here is all this way. Let me put the name on that to make sure. This is the uh, functional. The functional group region. Functional group region and the um, Fingerprint is here. <clears throat> it's not, oh, sorry, this one is not doing Finger print. So this area from 1400 to 400 is the fingerprint region. This is the one that is uh, bending. Okay. The one that is stretching is in the functional group region. Okay. It's in this other area here that you can see all the functional groups how they do basically all the stretchings and the bendings we saw most of them here in this other part, which is the lowest part uh, in, in terms of the wavelengths. What happened when you have a molecule, remember that each atom and in each bonding allow us to have bending and stretching. So if you have this carbonyl group here, you will have an expression, but also because it's a double bond, they can do uh, they can do the stretching going symmetric or asymmetric, but they can do the bending and if they can go ups and downs, okay, in the bendings. Uh, this is very important because I mean you will see some values in the functional group region for the carbonyl group, and then you will have also some values for the carbonyl in the fingerprint region, okay? Um, also, <clears throat> we can use these charts in the chapter 13, or if you prefer, you can use the appendix in the book. Okay. To say which page you can find this appendix. It's like a very long table. That table has 
basically most of the fingerprint regions. So sometimes it can be confused or uh, because it can be overlapping one uh, band, one absorption band with another one. So it can be one in top of the other one. They will start in um, appendix A15. Go in my chat room. Okay, we can find that in the appendix. A15, A16, A17. Okay, in these three appendix. So these three pages has basically the most um, common <clears throat> um, functional groups. They have alkane groups, they have alkene groups, they have alkene groups, have the aromatics. If the aromatic, for example, um, aromatic meaning that is a benzene ring, it is only with one substituent, which is they call mono uh, substituent. Um, you have some different uh, wavelength that you can find those stretching and those bending uh, assortion bands in the wavelength. But if you have uh, this substituent that has two substituents, depends if the substituent is in the para position, meaning in position one and position four, they have some uh, wavelength exactly in that position for those. It is, has two substituents, but it's in an ortho, which is basically not exactly in the contrary. It will be more closer, okay, to the, uh, the two substituents. Or if we have in the meta position, which is one, um, one alternated uh, carbon, in the ring structure, meaning that you left this one with a substituent and you will have a substituent here. We will learn more about that later in the, um, when we cover in the chapter 18 for the benzene ring. But um, I want to uh, explain a little bit in how you can see when you have more than one. If you have uh, a meta position, it will be here, okay? Or it can be here. When you have an ortho, it can be next to that substituent in any way, going up or going down. But when it's para, it's completely opposite, okay? And if you have more than two, so depends on the areas. Remember, we need to count the carbons to see where is the location. So they have different um, absorption bands in the wavelengths, okay? So they have also those, they have for eaters, they have for alcohols, different kinds of acids, amines. Also with the new components that we learned um, from chapter 15, we have the enines, the amides, um, and other inorganic uh, compounds too, okay? <clears throat> So basically the, um, the appendix has everything, but uh, I mean, it's up to you, depends on the exercising. You can use the appendix or you can use the tables or you can use uh, the information that we have previously for the lab. Uh, some tables, this one, the 13.4 um, is for stretching. Stretching, if you see the wavelength is more uh, I mean, it's more than a thousand, okay? That one is uh, for stretching depends on what functional group you will have. It's like a value in a range that you can look in the spectra and see if you have present that absorption band. It is nothing in that area, meaning that it's like mostly like a, a baseline. You don't have anything. So that functional group is not in the sample. Okay, but if you have a, a spectra band, you need to look and see. What I recommend usually is trying to draw lines where they start and 
where they uh, finish. So basically, it will tell you how it looks like. Okay. Do we have to memorize the table? Um, no. For the test, um, I will allow you to use the, te uh, the, the test book for the test. You don't need to um, memorize all these tables. <laughs> Okay. Um, for the quizzes, will it be the same way? Uh, the quiz, uh, the, yeah, the, the quiz, it will start today. It will finish tomorrow. You can take any time. Remember, once you click on the quiz, I, I was going to announce later. But if once you announce the quiz and you click to, to open, once you see that, you need to complete it. It's not like you can put on hold and then go back. So just when you sit try to do i put 40 minutes but it, it can be done before of that i just put more time um and once you sit please finish because i mean once you click on that and it's over the time it will be closed completely okay is the quiz proctored um i use the quiz uh let me go here in the um let me show you where is the location make sure everyone is in the same page and you can find everything um in the table of content i think i put the links but let me check if no i will do a, a folder and put the links because I, I already posted the first two quizzes. Today I will post the other. I try to go more in advance uh, so you can uh, see the links. I mean, you cannot open, but you can see the links that is uh, available. Um, check. No, I don't put the links, but I will put the links later. But I, if you go in submission review, you click quizzes. And is, I mean, it's available now. Don't press until you have completely the 40 minutes uh, window to completely in one time, okay? Um, it's open now, but don't do it before we finish the class because it will include some of the IR spectas, okay? Um, let me go back. I, I also will uh, do a, a, a folder after I finish, I will do a folder so you can have those links uh, available more easy for you guys, okay? And also, it will do, I will do the same for the test. Um, here, going back here for the aspect. What I recommend is try to do like a lines with a ruler. Uh, also, I mean, with eye, you can use to draw some lines and see what is the wavelength that you're looking. Okay, because I mean, it's not showing all of them, but generally uh, it's better to look first in the functional group region, because when we go in the fingerprint region, you will see a lot of uh, areas that they go lower in the absorption band, but they can go all the ones that goes a little more bigger in the intensity. So that one, it can be overlapping in the smaller ones, and you cannot see very well exactly what is the functional group that you have doing the bending. So what I recommend go uh, to the functional group region first to identify the most common ones. And then with the molecular formula, you can um, see it is uh, possible that you can have that um, molecule, okay? Um, usually, when we do something like that, like the IR spectroscopy to do the analysis and identification, you use this one and use another kind of analysis method, or you will know um, what is what it will be your final product. So you know exactly uh, what you're creating in order to identify the final molecule. So that's why I recommend first go in the functional groups to get the um, big picture for the different uh, functional group that you have. Also, it will tell you 
it is a green structure or it is a linear structure. Let me go uh, here and back. When you have when you have green structure, it will be showing wavelengths or strong bands here. Okay. When you have, because this is a carbon carbon double bond, you can also have these ones, but these ones are linear. This one is for aromatic. Okay. And that's why we need to make sure um, we identify the correct one. Okay. This is carbon carbon double bond in linear. This one is carbon carbon double bond in aromatic. We have triple bonds too. Okay, carbon carbon triple bonds, uh, carbon nitrogen triple bonds. Okay, so we're looking exactly in those areas and see what we, we can find. This is like a puzzle, it's very similar to the, uh, to the mass spec that we do before. So we need to find what is showing in the spectra so you can make lines on those spectra and trying to match those wavelengths with the tables, okay? When we have carbon and oxygen, it will have a very strong peak in this wavelength. The alcohol and the carboxylic acid, it can be some kind of tricky because uh, it's kind of similar that it can overlap one on top of the other one. Um, what I recommend here, I mean, look for the intensity because one is like very uh, narrow, I mean, small peak. It's a strong, but it's like, uh, um, let me see if I have an alcohol here. There. Oh, okay, I have a carboxylic acid. This one is a carboxylic acid, see? because has the propinion. This is for OH. Let me see. OH. Can it be but okay. It's kind of similar to the carboxylic acid, but the thing is that we have a CH that are linear that is in this region too, which is very confusing. Let me go. No. Let me open another document that we can have a better view for that. If I have go here and we go in the lab, that one will be more specific. Dr. Lozada? Yes. yes. The mastering chemistry software have uh, sample problems that we can work on that'll help us get familiar with these? Yes. Uh, I post the link. I sent an email like a few minutes before the class starts with the uh, access code. Try to see if you can have an access because I'm trying to use the same uh, course that I used for the Orgo one. I just include more time in the in the registration and the final day. So I, I change the dates only. And they say it's working, but I want to make sure. If you have any okay. to access, let me know. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um okay. Okay, one here. Um let me check everyone is seeing the same, yeah, the same that I'm seeing. <laughs> okay. Um this is an alcohol group. Definitely, this one is a very, uh, I mean, it's, it's an alcohol group. When we do the lines here, look at this one. Um, if we do the lines, another one, put another one here. Okay. They start exactly at 3200, and they go 3200, 3500. So this one is a very good alcohol <laughs> uh, absorption band, okay? 
And this one here next is exactly, I need to mention that because it's exactly at 3,000 and it's finishing at 28 or 29, something like that. I'll go here and then stretching more. So I have this two line. This one is like 2850 to 3000, which is telling me that I have carbon carbon bonding um, stretching and carbon carbon bonding stretching with hydrogen. And it's linear because it's below the 3000. This one, it tells me that I have an alcohol group. OH and and I have here C C H stretching. So this is linear. If I'm going here, I can look for the bendings for those. So this one it can be something that is bending with the OH, I think or the CC, uh, carbon carbon hydrogen for that area here. Um, other bendings here for carbon carbons um, in that area. We have these two that is linear because has the carbon carbon stretching. If I go in the chart, let me go back in the chart. Stretching. Um, that is 1500. Okay, what well, I'm, I'm referring for the carbon hydrogen, see, you can have a medium broadband intensity that it goes for 3300 to 2700. So that stretching for carbon carbon, it can be something very uh, big, the range in the wavelength. But if you definitely have something here in this area, and then you have something in this area, the carbon carbon is double bond, okay? But it's linear. But if you have this one and has also these two, you have a ring structure, okay? So in this particular, let's see, 16, uh, let me do another line here to make sure. Okay, so this is 1450 to 1500. 1450 to 1500. So you have a strong peak in here. This is a ring structure, which is below 3000. Let me make sure this one too. That is a ring, looks like a ring structure. Uh, ring It can be some kind of uh, here. CCH, CC, let me look in the other table here when we have carbon, carbon, double bond. Okay, we have bending vibrations in between 1450 to 1420 for CH. And we have below 
3300. This kind of a stretching here, or I mean, this one go a little bit more. So because it's below 3000, is this kind of linear here because it's 2960, 20, 2850. And that very strong peak that we can see is something like CH2 bending or CH bending. Okay, it will be something like this one because it doesn't go to 1500 completely. So we need to go in that area. So in here, this is the CH linear, and this one is for the CH stretch. That's why I say it's kind of confusing sometimes when you go in that region because it can be a, it can be a CH2 or CH that has in the middle like a tertiary carbon, but this is bending. Okay, this is a stretching and this one is a stretching. So basically, this one it can be carbon, carbon, carbon at some point. They have the OH, uh, but it's linear the molecule. Okay. So when we look in the charts, we need to make sure we cover those areas for the bending because I mean in that region, the fourteen hundred, it can be some uh, values for the bending vibrations that we uh, don't take in consideration so much. So that, that's why it's good to go in the tables too in order to make sure you get the correct answer, okay? Um, also, when you have something that is very strong based on the electronegativity, uh, the wavelengths, it can be shifted, but a little bit. It, it can be no more than 100 wavelengths, 100 uh, centimeters in the wavelength, they can shift, but it can be shifting a little bit here. So that's why it doesn't go completely to a 1500, but it can be making a little uh, shifting to the, to the right, okay? So because here we have the OH, OH is a very uh, close to the fluorine. We need to consider that when we try to analyze this region in the lower fingerprint area, okay? Um, when we have, uh, what I recommend is doing the lines. Look first in this area for the uh, higher wavelength, trying to assign uh, based on the wavelength uh, values that you get. And then go, if you have any doubts, goes in the uh, fingerprint region in order to see what kind of bending you can have, okay? In order to identify the final molecule. Um, let me go back here. So when we have second carbon-carbon uh, double bonds, we can have something bending in these regions for the 800 or 900. Okay, depends on what substituent we have. It is a cis or it's a trans. The only thing is that when you have a carbon-carbon double bond, remember, you will have some stretching values first. And together, you need to have some bending values. Okay. Make sure you look in both sizes and in both areas in order to get the correct one. Okay. When we have carbonyl group, for the carbonyl group, we have a stretching uh, that we have here, very strong uh, peak that is in this region in the 1780 to 1650. That one, uh, that that broad band, it will go very uh, down in the spectra because it's very strong, but needs to have another area for the carbon and hydrogen, it is an aldehyde, okay? This area here for the aldehyde is shown. If you have a carbonyl, but here is more carbon-carbon bonding, you don't have this peak, okay? Um, let's see other things that we can see. Okay, this is propinyl. It's an alkene. We have a triple bond here. 
that triple bond here, which is this one. <laughs> we have this area here that is an aldehyde because it's propineol. Um, it will tell you here what is the um, this, the stretching in these two areas. We have the OH group that is in the 3300, which is very strong. But the carbon-carbon double bond, it will be in this three. Okay. If we look in the bending, we can also find other uh, broadbands that is very strong. If we look here, this is in the nine, no, in the 1100, close to that. 1100, if we look back here in the table, Mm. This one is not content here, but if we look in the appendix, which is the one that is more complete, that one, it will tell me that is some kind of bending for the, uh, the other oh, bending. Yeah. It tells me the aldehyde, it is aliphatic aldehyde, let me see, I know this, this is the page 816, if you have the book with you, and you need to look in the second area, I don't have uh, another camera, so I need to do like a zoom here in my camera, so I'm looking in this chart, and I look aldehydes, and they have two types of aldehydes. You can have one that is linear, which is the aliphatic, and you can have another one that is the aromatic. When you look, they will have a value here in the top with the wage lens. And you will have first the uh, area for the functional group, and then you have the area for the fingerprint. And they have one value here that says that is moderated the broadband and is between 1100 to a thousand okay so it will be between a thousand and a thousand a hundred okay um this is in the a16 which is the most the most complete tables but if you look in the in the chapter 13, they have more, okay? Uh, just um, to see. Um, another, another one that we can see is the uh, normal methyl uh, ethanidamide, which is an amide. The amide has the carbonyl group with the amino, okay? That is um, an amide. We don't cover in orgo one, but we will cover later in orgo two. If we want to uh, identify those, they have a carbonyl group, okay, which has very strong band here for the carbonyl together with the bendings, okay? <laughs> so that is the, for the carbonyl. Um, we have CH3 here and we have the CH3 here. Those CH3 and CH3, is locating in this area here, okay? And because it has one hydrogen, the amino group, because it's a primary ami uh, amide, that primary amide has only one P here and it's very strong, okay? So that's why we have those. Um, when we look for the bending, for the nitrogen with the hydrogen, we can have that bending in this region here, okay? Um, I know we don't cover this, this kind of um, organic molecule yet, but I mean, it's hard to identify because we have 
it's, it's easy to identify because we have the carbonyl group and we have the amino acid, okay? And when we look, we look for those first and then go in the bending uh, region, okay? Um, any questions with the IR? Other uh, quick tip that we can um, use. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So somewhere, I don't remember where I learned it, but um, I remember the term fingerprint region. And um, I remember that we were supposed to ignore the fingerprint region. I don't know if this was the same type of spectroscopy, but um, I'd just like to clear that confusion up. Okay, uh, I say that before because we don't cover the whole thing. It was only for the lab, but here we don't need to completely ignore. We need to try to match when we have doubts about what is the final molecule. Meaning that uh, at some cases we need to look and see to make sure it is a, a ring structure or it is uh, like, like is showing here in the, in the amide area that you have that nitrogen and hydrogen bending in order to confirm that it's an amide, okay? Or if you have a ring structure, which, has, which is an aromatic, you need to confirm those. And the only way that you can confirm is using that area for the fingerprint, okay? Here is oh. another... It says generally not useful for the fingerprint reason. Is the fingerprint reason kind of just to make sure that you're getting it right? Mm -hmm. So what I recommend, use first the functional groups. Um, I'm showing the, let me see, I'm showing, yes, I'm showing this one. So this one is the most general. When we look, in the stretching area, we look for higher than 1500, okay? Then that you see what kind of uh, molecule you can have or what kind of functional group you have in your molecule, meaning if you have a CH stretching, but you're not so sure about it is a linear structure or it is an aromatic because it can go in both sizes and both areas, meaning that you will have some kind of banding here, more than 3,000 and other bands here, less than 3,000. You need to confirm those carbon-carbon double bonds. The area that you confirm those is basically in this region here that is not showing uh, in here because it's a fingerprint, it's bending uh, bands. So that's why we need to look here and then look here in order to confirm. Also, if you have alcohols, but you're not so sure about that, you go in the fingerprint to confirm it, okay? It's to make sure you can get the correct answer uh, when you're doing the analysis. If not, you will, you will need another kind of uh, analysis method in order to get the final answer. And we will do that in the lab. I mean, because um, we don't have the choice to do all, all the area for the, for the fingerprint because it can be some overlapping one on top of the other one and it can be confused. But, uh, and also because I just give it um, the worksheets paper. So it, it can be some, when you print it out in the computer, it cannot be very clear, the resolution. So that's why we need to go first um, to make sure in the area for the functional groups. Then if you need to go in the fingerprint, you can go in the fingerprint, but um, it can be some kind of a confusing. So that's why do we put other two or three different analyses in order to get the final answer because you need to came out with the final molecule, okay? Um, but in the test, because I mean, this one it will be going 
in the quiz and also in the test, I will ask you where is showing for an alcohol, for example, you need to know what is the wavelength for that. If I ask you what is the fingerprint region, you need to say, okay, fingerprint region is between the 1400 to 400. If I ask you um, where I can see the stretching for the carbon-carbon double bonds, you need to look for stretching carbon-carbon double bonds, okay? So this is what, I, what I'm asking in the test. You need to be very specific. I need to answer. I mean, I can, I can give you a question that it can be some kind of confusing that you need to do the whole thing, okay? So I, for, for, the, for the quizzes and for the test, I will go exactly what I need, okay? I will ask those and you need to go in details. It is a nitrile, it is a stretching for the OH, something like that. Okay. Also in the MCAT, they ask you for the different stretching bands. And they want to see what is the region of that area. So that's why I, I need to tell, I mean, I need to teach you everything about that. Okay. So one picture I can, I don't, I don't think I have this one in my courses. I can upload. The only thing is that you need to do uh, when you download, make sure you download in a PNG format and then try to do zoom in order to get the general uh, chart, okay? Another picture that we can use um, is this one. I don't know if it is very clear or no. Uh, for me, it looks like a little, a little clear, not so much. Um, they have different um, the functional groups. This is in the area for the uh, functional group area. This is the, see they have very dark area here for the fingerprint region, okay? Um, this is from different book, but usually it's between the 1400 to 400, okay? Um, if you have esters, alcohols, it will look like here, the stretchings. Um, the bending, sorry. Um, the only thing is that they specify here, it is a strong, it's medium, or it's weak, or it's broad, or it's narrow. That's the only thing. Um, when you have amines, it will be in this region here between the 14, uh, sorry, 16, 650 to 900. Carboxylic acid, they do bendings here in the 900 to 950. When you have nitrogen compounds, you have one here between the 1450 to 1550 or um, in the 1300. When you have al allogens, the allogens and it's a linear structure, they go here. So this this um, this picture. Let me make sure that you're seeing the the same picture that I'm seeing. No, sorry about that. Okay, go back here. This area here has the fingerprint, okay, uh, which is the da the dark area. The um, functional group is the white area. Um, they specify it is. Strong, medium, weak, broad, narrow, and variable. Okay, that's the letters that we have in the green shade that is telling me the, the range that I can find different components. When we have aromatics, it's in this region. Carbonyls or carbon double bond oxygens here. If I have carbon carbon double bonds are here in the 1600. If I have alkenes, carbon-carbon double bond, but in this case, um, is a uh, bending stretching, bending vibration is between the 750 to 1,000. If you have carboxylic acid, it will be 900 
or 950. Nitro compounds, um, 1250 to 3050. So they have, I would put this one also in my courses like another reference uh, besides uh, the chart and also the information in the lab manual. And I think with the book too, so it will be plenty reference for uh, identifying uh, different compounds. But see here we have the stretching um, area that it goes for carboxylic acid between the 20, 2400, well, it's 25, almost 20, 26. 100 to 30, almost 3200. So they go um, variable and it can be very broad. So basically it will be very big area here, okay, coming down. And we have alcohols and also the phenols, which is another alcohol, but has an aromatic ring on it. Those are located here between the 3200 to 34. So that's why when we have carboxylic acid, they go big, but the alcohols here, they go, um, it's narrow. So it's not, not very big in that area. Okay. Another, Another photo that I have is when you have triple bond. The triple bond for an extreme, it can be something like that. It's not very strong. Um, it's in the area here, a little bit more than 20,000, but it doesn't go to 22,000, okay? So it's in that area, but it's quick. When we have triple bonds, but it's linear, it's like that. So at some point we can, I mean, we can miss in this one because it's not very big that peak or that uh, absorption band, okay? Um, for the nitriles, we have the carbon triple nitrogen bonding. That region is very strong, okay? because has the aromatic, but if you don't have the aromatic, it will be something smaller. But I mean, it's, it's there, but maybe you can miss it. So that's why we need to go back and trying to check if we can match the functional groups and corroborate with the fingerprints, okay? Because it can be some kind of confusing and to make sure we need to confirm those values, okay? So we can also use this kind of uh, chart in order to see different um, different uh, spectra. Okay, let me um, go back here and check another one. Okay, this one. See, has like a very strong peak here. This is a carbonyl group. And this is a stretching. I mean, because when you look, 1500, 1600, 17, 20, or 25. Okay. So it's in that region. And here is confusing because you have this area that is covered from here to here. Okay. So that, that is a carbon, carbon, hydrogen stretching, but you don't know if you have a double bond on it or no, it is aromatic or no, okay? So that's why we need to make sure we go on the charts to make sure. Um, also, I think this is what I'm showing. Let me make sure I'm showing this one. Yes, what I'm showing is the lab manual. When you look in the lab manual, they have also at the end, 
another um, summary just to have for reference. Okay. And they have pictures in how it looks like those uh, absorption bands. Okay. When you have alcohols or carboxylic acid, when you have primary and secondary amines, also when you have the triple bond stretching for a carbon carbon or carbon nitrogen. And also they have the region for the carbon hydrogen stretching when you have a linear structure or when you have an aromatic. Okay. Um, they don't go further, only showing the aldehydes and ketones, but they have the carbonyl group and they have also the, um, when it's aromatic and when it's linear, the carbon-carbon double bond in the alkenes, okay? Um, other reference that we can use is at the beginning of the, um, this lab manual, Page you remember we saw this one in the lab, but we have this chart here. Let's see. So this chart, this is very general. If you see, it's not showing anything more here in this area because for the lab, they don't require to do a finger fit analysis. I mean, that lower wavelength area. But you need to identify the functional group. So that's why we have the functional group region showing here. Also, they put how it looks like each of them, those uh, peaks, the most prominent ones, how to identify alcohol, aminos, alkane only, okay? When you have double bond, they go in both sides uh, before and after the 33,000. When we have the uh, C double bond oxygen is in the 1720 or something similar. Here we have a range in the broadband, okay? So it's up to you uh, for the lab doing uh, this one using the test book or using the other reference that I showed you before. Um, also for the class, it's good to use the book with the appendix because we need to corroborate uh, because I will ask specifically. And you can use the other reference, but try to, uh, try to corroborate in the different reference that you have. Okay, um, goes back here. To finish this um, chapter, we have the last section that is the UV and visible light spectroscopy. Usually um, what I explained before that, you know, is very um, characteristic that um, area for the, um, energy that basically has an effect in the uh, molecule, this, um, this kind of um, analysis usually use the Beer-Lambert law that basically um, your sample is, is very kind of similar the machine that we use for that, uh, the machine that we use for the IR. So it's something like this one, we open the area for the sample here and we put the sample is also in a clear vial and we have the source for the light. The only thing is that the light is a uh, ultraviolet and the visible light, okay? They have different mirrors and what is happening is it's not the destructive analysis. What is happening is that the light reflects in the mirrors and pass through the sample. And then you have the detector that is um, calibrated for looking what is happening in the sample, how they vibrate or get excited. 
using the detector for the uh, ultraviolet and visible light. Okay, so it's kind of similar. The only thing is that, like I explained, the basically the uh, light pass through the sample and what is happening is that when they are and uh, they have the carbon carbon double bond and you don't have any light pass through they basically are in a ground state when you have the light coming through the sample is absorbing light that light is a type of energy that energy is the one that is required to get excited or get a movement between the carbon-carbon double bonds. Um, and what happening is that from ground state, they get excited. And that, um, let me explain with this. Um, those um, loves for the double bonding meaning put a drawing here when you have a carbon carbon double bond remember single bond is like that but when you have double bonds you have one here and you want one here okay and you have the single bond here so this is i mean one is single the other one is p right and what is happening that when you have in a ground state they stay hermetically in that state they don't move once you put the energy they start to moving and when they start to move in they try to uh i mean these two um double bonds it can be doing like bending so they get excited so they start to move in and the other loves here for the single um for the for the sigma bond, they start to move. So that's why it's in the excited state here. So they go from here to here. Okay. And what is happening is that the machine analyzes that kind of um with the detector that kind of energy or that kind of um behavior after they get that energy that is required to get excited and they detect it and what is happening is that you have at the end a peak or a signal that is showing that in that wavelength they met the amount of energy to get excited after that they go back to the ground state okay so that's why you only see one peak or maybe two peaks depends on how many double bonds you have and then after that you don't see anything Okay, and this is based on the Beer's number law because it requires the concentration, um, the length path, which is the uh, the wavelength, and they use the molar absorptivity for the sample. Depends on what kind of sample you have. This is a very uh, characteristic number for depend on of the of the molecule. Okay. So when we have double bonds, depends on the, uh, for example, here I have one table. We can have double, bo double bonds that is uh, conjugated, okay? When we have only two bonds, we can have one peak that is showing at that wavelength range. After that, that you don't see anything, or before that, you don't see anything. So you will see those. But when you have triple, I mean, three double bonds, four double bonds, it will increase because the amount of energy that is required to get that excitement in the molecule, it will be larger, okay? Um, because more energies that you have in order to get that excitement, it requires more energy. So that's why the wavelength because it's related with the Pierce number law, that absorbance is related with the wavelength and also with the concentration, okay? So depends on how many double bonds you will have that 
value, it will change, okay? And it's very specific for each, uh, the amount of the double bond that you have for each sum, okay? In this case, it's very similar to the GC or the gas um, spectroscopy analysis. You need to have different um, calibration chart or calibration table that you have different concentrations for your initial sample. Meaning if you're doing a reaction, you will have the reactants with different concentration and you will have also to do the same thing with your product. You need to have different concentrations. And with that, you can see if you're forming double bonds or not, okay? Um, and it's, it is changing something uh, in, in the reaction, okay? Other example here is the reaction for the nitroethane to an ion. They only get absorbance at that wavelength. After that, you don't see anything. If you do a measurement in how you see the kinetics for the reaction, you can take samples every time. And then you need to look for how much it can absorb based on the value uh, we have in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the book, we have a table for those, uh, for the spectroscopy. Um, they have a table that you can see the different, uh, wavelengths uh, for different components. So you can estimate also that uh, rate of a reaction, okay? Depends on the different times. But this is very specific when you're doing um, your analysis for the, uh, for the product, okay? Um, Depends on the different double bonds, we will have that energy that increase is because we have more energy to get excited after they get absorbed that kind of energy, okay? Um, with all of these, I conclude the chapter 13. Do um, you have any questions for me now or we can take a break and then come back for the uh, questions? No, okay, let's resume for about 10 minutes. You can, I mean, you can take water, go to the bathroom and then we go, I will do the same. And then we can go back again and do some exercising. So I'm planning to use the assignment number one uh, that you can find in your, in my courses. Go back in that area. So you go in my courses. goes a course content and you will saw in the course content after After the publisher lectures, I have the class assignments. If you click on that, you will have the first pamphlet here, which says exam one assignments. You can click on that. Uh, when we go back, we go in this, okay? So I don't, uh, I will stop only sharing, okay? I will, uh, I will turn it off my video and I will turn it off uh, the, the microphone let's take like a 10 minute break and then coming back okay i will stop recording for those 10 minutes and then i go back to recording okay see you in a little bit excuse me i have a quick question uh -huh. um i just sent you a quick uh chat in the chat box i don't know if you could take a peek at it and let oh. me know okay yes uh my it's no problem i'm recording 
go uh, solve whatever you need to solve. Uh, I will post this video later after okay. the Zoom with the with the lab, okay? In, in the event that this is still going on, because lab is going to be starting soon as well. It, um, it's okay. It, Don't worry. All right. Thank you. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, coming back now, when you open the um, the file in the exam one assignment, um, it will tell you about the lecture number two. So basically, it's covering mass spec and IR in this area. So sometimes you will see that is, uh, I mean, I label most of the pages to see what is the area that you need to look in the book or in the PowerPoint, okay? Um, here in the first um, question, they ask about do the drawing, like I showed you before, um, that has um, basically all the um, general uh, functional group for the alkane, alkenes, the aromatics, alcohol, the carbonyls. It was the same kind of a uh, picture that I showed you before. Let me uh, open that. <clears throat> I close to minimize what I have here, but let me open again um, that picture. Sorry, okay. Okay, so basically um, in this page, I just uh, put the question about how you can identify those, what are the wavelengths? So basically what I expected um, for the students is try to identify the most important functional groups in the uh, functional group region, which is in this area. So we have the amino in this region. Um, we have um, the alcohol, um, the carbon hydrogen stretching, the- Are you looking at a, a chart right now? Cause I see the oh, um, lecture assignment. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, sorry. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, I I try to check, but every time I'm in a switching. Sorry. Let me know if you don't see anything in the in the screen. Okay, what I'm trying to point it out. So this one is the is the is one of the pictures that I showed you before. Um, has all the uh, functional group area here. More than uh, fourteen hundred to four thousand. So in this question for the number one, is asking how you can identify those and what is the location. So you need to do like a drawing or something so you can identify what is those locations. So I, I use this um, photograph in order to do that. You can use also the photograph or you can do the, um, the drawing is all, only to remember where are the most important uh, functional groups in this area, okay? Alcohols, we have here um, amino groups. Remember when we have primary aminos, primary aminos that has two hydrogens. So basically the band here has two peaks, okay? When is NH only has one peak. That's the difference between when you have NH2 and NH, okay? Is that the peak, it will have two, I mean, the, the, the band, it will have two peaks. When it's NH2, when it's only NH, it's only one, okay? Um, for the carbon-carbon with hydrogen bonding, when you have alkenes and 
um, I mean alkenes that has carbon carbon double bond is in this area here all the way. More than 3000 and less than 3000 is in both ways. But when you have linear and it's an alkane carbon carbon single bond, the stretching for the CH is below 3000. Okay, so you will see an area only here for that. Okay. When it's a carboxylic acid, remember this one go all the way here to here. That is the one that is, is getting everything in that area. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> when we have a carbonyl group, it's the stretching here in the 1650 to 1800 almost, uh, and it's very big. Okay, so that is a very prominent. But when we have um, <clears throat> triple bonds, <coughs> sorry. Um, when we have triple bonds, we can have the peak around here between the 2100 to 2260. Okay. So that is what is asking basically in the first question. Let me go back to the uh, assignment. So basically when we look, they have from A to A to I to see what is the most important ones, okay? <coughs> In the question number two, they ask about calculate the molecular ion and then do the um, double bond equivalency or see how many double bonds you have or the saturation equation for each formula. So we have the molecular formula for those. And then we need to do the drawing for at least two possible structures. I mean, we don't know how many peaks we have for the mass spec, but we only have molecular formula. So that's why they ask about possible structures. So it can be something that in the case uh, that we don't have any double bonds, we can try to draw what is based on the amount of carbons and amount of hydrogens. And if we have anything else like uh, halogens or oxygens or nitrogens, we can try to match based on the amount of hydrogens and carbons that we have, okay? Try to get um, the octet rule for each of the atoms, okay? What does it mean by calculate the molecular ion? Um, <clears throat> calculated the molecular ion, remember when we, <clears throat> let me go back here. When we start with the mass spec, in the mass spec, <coughs> okay, in the mass spec, when you put the sample and the sample do the fragmentation, the first fragmentation that they do is losing one electron. It's not changing anything in the amount of carbon hydrogen that you have. It's only losing the one electron in the outer shell. So basically the molecule get the positive charge because it's not neutral, because it's losing one electron. And sorry, <coughs> in the amount of carbon and hydrogens, you will still have in the whole uh, structure. Okay, you don't do any other fragmentation, so they still intact your sample. I mean your molecule. Okay, so what they ask you is do um, do a calculation depends on the molecular weight. In here for the pentane, pentane has five carbons and we have two, four, six, plus six is 12 hydrogens, okay? So that is your, um, that is your uh, molecular uh, formula. When you have the molecular ion is the same. The only thing is <coughs> sorry. 
fine. I'm seeing fine. I'm recovering for an asthma, so I'm so sorry about my coughing. <laughs> I tried to get something before I'm coming back, but it's not working. <laughs> okay, so you will have this uh, molecule with a positive charge at the end. Okay, so it will be something like this one. Let me do opening a little bit more. So you will have something like this one. Okay, let me get a little more so. So because you're only losing one electron, it stays the same. It's the same amount of carbon, it's the same amount of hydrogens. It's only losing one, one electron in the outer shell. So basically the molecular ion is this whole molecule, which is your intact molecule with only losing one electron, okay? So when we go back to do the uh, problem in the first one, we have five carbons, 11 hydrogens and one chloro. Your molecular ion there, <clears throat> still the same. I mean, for that one, which is here, you have five carbons. So you need to use the brackets, always use the brackets because that is the correct way in how you do the, uh, in how you draw, uh, how you write it down the molecular ion a format, okay? So you use the brackets and you need to use the positive and the point for the radical. So you can use, um, in this case, because we don't know exactly why is the final uh, structure. It can be something like this one has, that has the chlorine at the end, but it can be the chlorine attached to any other carbons because I mean, in terms of the amount of hydrogens, it will be the same. Okay, just only moving the chlorine for any kind of uh, position for the carbon, it doesn't change me how much hydrogen I have left. It's the same, okay? So that's why they say draw two possible uh, structures. So because I don't know exactly which one is the correct, I just use the molecular formula with the brackets. So I use five carbons, 11, hydrogens and a chlorine, okay? Then I close my bracket and I need to put the positive um, some kind of point for the, uh, so we need to use the positive and we need to put a point in order to get the radical, okay? That is the uh, molecular ion. And how you do the calculation for the amount? I mean, it's where it's supposed to show it. We need to calculate five carbons. So we have 12 times five plus 11 plus the chlorine. The chlorine is, um, you can look in, <clears throat> let me go here to look for, I think chlorine, yes is 35. So my molecular ion in that will be 106. So there is showing exactly 106, or it can be showing two more because remember they have <coughs> <coughs> sorry, chlorine, um, 35, which is 75%, and they have chlorine in 37, which is the 24% existent in the natural, um, I mean, you can find those in, in, in the natural form. So it can be two more, which is one away, okay? So when you look in the spectra for the mass spec, you can find your molecular ion in a peak that is pronunciated in that area. Your zeta over m, it will be that value, okay? Mm. 
So this one, it will be your, <coughs> sorry, your setup over F, which is the area when you look that is located. So if you, we look back, let me go here. In the spectra, your M over zeta, I put inversely, you will have a peak for your molecular ion in the 108. Okay, that one it will be for this compound that is five carbons, 11 hydrogens, and one chloro. Okay, then. <clears throat> So when it says calculate the molecular ion, does it mean the mass of it? Yes, you need the mass for carbon. So you need to do, um, let me see. You need to do for carbon first. So carbon, you have five times the molecular weight for carbon, which is 12. Then it will tell you the number. Um, So this is 60. Then I have hydrogen, which I have 11 times one. So I have 11 and then I have chlorine that you have um, 35 times one, it will be your 35. And when you add all those, um, it will be 106 in total, okay? When you add all those, let me do a line here. Remember, you're adding all these and you get your molecular weight of the molecular ion, which is 106. Based on the amount of carbon that you have, hydrogens, and in this case, chlorine, okay? Um, <clears throat> when you have something that is an isotope, like the chlorine or um let me see chlorine is one that is very high sometimes for carbon it doesn't make any difference because carbon is only one percent hydrogen uh, doesn't make any kind of difference too nitrogen is only 0.36 but in the case um uh, for chlorine, C is very big, the difference, because it's 20, uh, 75 and 24. And bromine is very big, too. So those, we need to count those uh, isotopes in order to get the correct uh, value, OK? Uh, but if they, the question asks you only for the molecular ion, and you don't have that kind of range indifference, meaning that you're using only, I mean, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and the oxygen, because it's only, I mean, 0.2 for the oxygen 18, so which is very low. You don't need to do those calculations for the, I mean, for the extra isotope, okay? But when you have chlorine and bromine, those, uh, these two, are very uh, big, the difference. So that's why we need to do those, okay? But for the other one, uh, we don't require, only if you see that, you know, the spectra has that kind of little point extra. When you look, you see, oh, that one is an isotope. So I don't care so much because they don't ask me about how much is the molecular ion for the isotope, okay? But if they ask you exactly for the isotope, you need to do that, yeah? Uh, so that's why here I do uh, carbon 13, 35, uh, I chlorine 35, and I do chlorine 37 just in case that we have an isotope. Okay, so this one it will be my M over zeta. Let me give us this area here. This is M over zeta. Okay which is the uh, mass over the um, theta is the um, the charge, which is a positive one, okay, for, for each one. Um, then I do the double bond equivalency. For the double bond equivalency, I need to look 
based on my um, molecular weight or molecular formula. So I use five carbons, 11 hydrogens, and one chloro. Okay. If I'm using doubles, now I need to do the calculation for that. Um, I'm using the saturated, okay? This is for saturated hydrogen, okay? Saturated hydrogen, I have five carbons, so I have five, times two plus two, okay? So I have 10 plus two, it will be 12. For the <coughs> hydrogens that are effective, I have five, sorry, I, I use the same hydrogens that I have in my molecular formula. This one, I use the formula for saturation. I will go later, let me finish this area. Um, for the effective, I use the same amount of hydrogen that is showing in the molecular formula, which is 11. Now I need to look and see if I have an halogen, a nitrogen, or an oxygen. So I need to look for those. If I have an halogen, in this case, I have that, which is the chlorum. Chlorum is an analogen. I need to add one more, okay? So that's why I'm putting, uh, adding one. It will be 12, okay? Because um, I have a chlorum, okay? So this one is, this one here is because I have the chlorum. Put a chlorum here. This one came from the CN H N plus two. So this is the correct um, formula when you have a, um, an alkane. Alkane is completely saturated. So each carbon has a hydrogen. So because N is five, it will be five here. It will be five. Uh, I'm missing something. I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm missing times two. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing. Okay. Is the So this one, it will be two, two times N plus two. Okay, that is the correct way. Um, okay, so it will be two times N. So I have N is five times two, I have 10. Plus two, it will be 12. So that's why I have the saturated with 12. Then I go here in the equation that I have the saturated minus the effective. So it's 12 minus 12, that's subtraction over two. So I need to divide the subtraction by two. And then because I mean, it's zero, I cannot divide zero over two, so it will be zero. I don't have any double bonds, which is meaning that I have all the carbons that are completely saturated so now I need to put my, uh, I need to draw my, my structure, depends on that amount of hydrogens that I have, and then I need to place a chlorum in uh, any carbons, okay? So what I'm doing is, if I, I have five carbons, I do a linear structure. So I have one, two, three, four, uh, I'm missing one. Make sure one, two, three, four, five. And I need another here. I do it quickly. OK. 
Okay. So I have another one here, and then I have my chlorum at the end. The other way is having a linear structure and have the chlorum in between, and I have one, two, three, four, and five, and the chlorum is here in carbon three. I mean, I can move the chlorum to carbon two, it doesn't matter, because when I'm counting this one, it will be a CH3, then one has a CH2, then this one has one H, so what, what I'm doing is placing, I mean, I, I'm, I'm changing the hydrogen for a different position. I'm changing the chlorine for a different position. But when I'm counting, I have the same amount of carbon, same amount of hydrogens, and the chlorine. Okay. So that I just only switching what is the position for the chlorine with the hydrogen. Okay. So they ask for two possible structure, you can only do two or you can go ahead and try as much as possible you want. Um, because I mean, depends on the carbons and hydrogens needs to be all um, in single bonds, okay? So you can do different isomers with that kind of uh, molecular formula, okay? Um, in the B, um, has 10 hydrogens and five carbons, doesn't has any oxygen or any uh, nitrogen or any halogen. So this one is more easy to do the calculation when we're going to do the uh, double bond equivalency. <clears throat> I can use um, the value for saturated, okay, saturated. Uh, saturated um, hydrogens for those you will have five times two plus two so it will be the same it will be 12 but the effective it will be the amount that is listed, so it's 10, okay? That's why I have, um, expression here. Okay, so when I place those values in the equation, I have the saturated that is 12 minus the effective, which is 10, <coughs> which when I do the subtraction, give me two divided by two, it will be one, okay? So that's why I need to have one double bond. That double bond, it doesn't matter where I place that. What I need to count is the amount of hydrogens that I have. Okay, so I need to come with something that has uh, 10 hydrogens, okay? So what I'm doing in that, <coughs> for the B, it will be a five carbon. So I have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. And the double bond, it can be here. Or I can have one, two, three, four, five, and I can have the double bond here. Uh, other structure is moving around the double bond. I can have something here, or uh, I can have a then. Um, I mean, this molecule and this molecule, when you move it, is the same, so it doesn't matter. The only thing is how you uh, place on a 3D shape um, based when you have a double bond, it is cis or it is trans, okay? So if you draw the linear, you will get the same, but if you draw in, in three-dimensional shape, 
you can have the cis and trans, okay? So that's the only thing that is different. So any of these apply for the B. We don't know exactly which one it is because, I mean, you only have the molecular formula, you don't have something else, okay? But if you have uh, the spectra, yes, you can try to identify what is the, um, the most convenient uh, drawing for your sample, okay? Here, to do the calculation for the molecular ion, we need to do the same like we do before for the A. So we need to see how many carbons, how many hydrogens. So when I'm doing that, <clears throat> I have five uh, carbons. So it will be five times 12 equals 60. And then I have four hydrogens, uh, 10. So I have 10 times one, it would be 10. And then my molecular, well, they say molecular ion like that, Mi, it can be uh, 70, okay? In this case, this is, remember, this is the M over zero, okay? And when I look in the spectra, if I have the spectra, I expect that I have one, peak or one line in that value for M over zeta, that is 70, okay? I don't expect that um, that line goes exactly to 100. Remember, um, that line, it will be lower, okay? Because when you have your, uh, your sample bombarded with the different electrons, um, they get fragmented and the amount that is counting, it will be less compared to the other fragments, okay? So that's why you will have that line here in 70, okay? But it will be like a smaller, it will be no bigger because they need to go, um, they go farther in the fragmentation. So basically you will have other uh, lines in the different M over value, um, frag, uh, values for, for the fragmentation uh, pieces, okay? <clears throat> e, okay, let's do the E, okay? I try to put everything here. I have the A, I have the B. The C doesn't have double bonds. So in the C, because we have the oxygen and we have two carbons, it can be an alcohol. So for the C, let's do the drawing. In double bond equivalency, because we have the oxygen, the oxygen doesn't make any difference. So that's why when I multiply uh, two, uh, two times two plus two, so two times two, it will be four, plus two, it will be six. And then here, in the effective, I have six already. So that's why it's six minus six divided by two. So I get zero, okay? Um, for the molecular ion, I have in carbons, two times 12 uh, equals 24. And then I have six hydrogens, six, times one, it will be six. And then I have oxygen and it will be 16 or times one. So it will be 16. And then I need to do the uh, addition. So it will be 30, 46. So my molecular ion, it will be, uh, yeah, 46. And this is my M over zero. Um, how I do the, the molecule, I have two carbons. So I have carbon, carbon here, and I have one oxygen here. Oxygen needs to have uh, other um, electrons for sharing. So that's why I put the hydrogen on it. Then I need to place all 
the other hydrogens, okay? So I have three here and two here, and this one, it will be six. So I can have that. The other way is to put the OH in the other, okay? Or I can have carbon, oxygen, which is sharing two electrons, okay? And then I place the hydrogens with the carbons, okay? I have one, two, three hydrogens, one, two, three hydrogens, okay? Remember, I'm, I'm putting this one just to uh, do the quick example, okay? But this one that is uh, doing the, the sharing electrons is with hydrogens here, okay? Any questions with these ones? I'm going to do the one that has the nitrogen to see the difference. And then I go for another uh, problem, okay? Any questions? No? Okay. Let's do the E. E has the nitrogen on it. Remember nitrogen, we need to subtract one. Uh, when we do the double bond equivalency, hydrogen saturated. So saturated, I have three times two. So it would be three times two plus two, six, eight. And then the effective, I have nine. minus one, it will be eight. I subtract one because I have the nitrogen, okay? So that's why, let me point it out here. This one is for the nitrogen, okay? When I have nitrogen, I need to do such subtraction. Um, okay. Now I need to do the molecular ion. Let's do it quick here. I have um, carbon, it will be three times 12. It will be 36. Hydrogens, I have nine times one, it will be nine. And then I have one nitrogen, nitrogen. Sure. Yeah, 14. Okay. We have 14 times 1. So I need to do the, the addition. So my molecular ion at the end, it will be uh, 59. Remember that is M over zero. Okay. Um, then I need to do the drawing. Let me do the drawing. For doing the drawing, <clears throat> we have three carbons. So one, two, three. At some point, I have a nitrogen on it. So I need to put the nitrogen here. Okay. What happened? The nitrogen needs to have two electrons more for sharing. So I need to have hydrogen here, hydrogen here. So I have two already. Then I have three here. Remember, this is a CH3. Then I have two and two. So I two, four, six, but, and three, it will be nine, okay? So I have those. Um, another way that I can do the drawing, let me see. And then I have a nitro here that has one CH3 here. Then I have a hydrogen here, so it will be four. 
I have three here. It will be seven, eight, and nine. Okay. Okay, it's another way that I can do that. So I have another hydrogen here, hydrogen here, and here and there, other way. Other way that I can do is move the nitrogen in the middle, and I have CH3, CH3, and then with this one, it will be another CH3, okay? So I can have N with CH3 in each one, okay? which I'm, I have my nine hydrogens, my nitrogen, and the three carbons, okay? I mean, they only ask for two, but I want to show you other ways that we can have extras, okay? Um, any questions? Okay. Um, here is another question. This is a tricky question, so we need to know what is in each part. This is a reaction. And sometimes we use this kind of uh, identification um, uh, techniques in order to identify what is happening in the synthesis. So here we have a double bond. After this reaction, that is an hydrolysis, acid hydrolysis, we can form alcohols. Then we do bromination and we add a hydrogen and bromine, okay, to remove that alcohol. And then we use uh, the Hoffman reaction to do a double bond, okay? Um, they ask in how you can differentiate one, I mean, each one of these uh, products and the reagents using these two techniques. Here you have the double bond if you're using IR, you will see a stretching in the area that has the alkene, okay? Here, you will have a OH group, which is not containing here, right? Then if I go to this area here, the OH is not showing in the IR area. So one thing that I can do is for, let me go here. So I need to go for absorption band. Carbon double bond. And I, go, I look for absorption bands, OH. Then here, I do for absorption band uh, for C, C, H is one area. Other thing that you can do in that area for the bromine is look for absorption bands halogen. Okay. And here you look again for the carbon-carbon double bond, but this one, it will be terminal. In the appendix for the IR, this is in IR area, um, in the appendix in the book, they have the location for, for which, uh, when you have an aliphatic, it is a terminal or it's in the middle, okay? That double bond that you have. So you can differentiate this band from this other band, okay? This one is in the fingerprint region that you will see that kind of bending, okay? From this product to this reactant, okay? Um, in the MS, it will be much easier because I mean, this one is going to break here in the CH3, it's going to break here in the CH3 and then you will get the double bond at the end. This one, it will be break here in the OH, so you will have this fragmentation and this other fragmentation, okay? And then it will start breaking in the middles, okay? For this one, it will be break here in the bromium. Oh, let me do that. So it will be breaking here, it will be breaking here. 
In this one, it will be breaking here and then they go in the middle, okay? Here they go first here and then they go in the middle. And this one, it will be breaking here first, then this one, and this one is the last, okay? That's the difference. And in the, remember, in the mass spec, we need to count is part. So basically you need to count, if it's breaking here, you need to count, let me see if I can change the color. You need to look for a um, molecular weight of fragments. Uh, this is for the MS, for the spectra, okay? Each fragment, when you do the analysis for each fragment, let me do the coloring here. When you look, you look for this one first, this one, it will be 15, the remanent, you have three carbons, it will be 40 something, 45, no, 40, 44 or something like that. Then you look for the other fragments, okay? When you look for this one, you go first in this area, and then with the OH, you have 17, and the remanent, you need to look for the, what is the molecular weight? Same thing here, you look for this one in the hole, as a whole fragment, and then you go the bromion, and, and because this one is the one that it will be separated first. Here you have the methyl group first, and then the remanent, uh, it will be the other fragment. Okay. Um, I think that's all. Um, you have any questions for me? Not right now. No. Okay, so I I, I I have a question. Uh huh. Does the molecule all the way on the right have an absorption band too? This one. Yeah. Yeah, yes. I mean this area. You need to look for absorption band. Uh, but the only thing is that the absorption band here it will be in the fingerprint. Uh fingerprint region. Let me look quick. In which area? Let me look the book. It will be in the appendix, and the appendix is the A15, A16, and 17. Um, for that one, it will be... It's a long table. Let me look. Okay, it will be exactly in the A15 alkenes, and you have, this is primary, so it's vinylic. I mean, they ask you about it is vinylic, it is a trans, this, it is a terminal, if the double bond is conjugated or no. So you need to look, because they have like five different, one, two, three, four, six different classifications. This is in the appendix in the book, the page A, A15, okay? Thank you. And when you look, <clears throat> let me give you the numbers. Okay, in the fingerprint, it will be a wide band between uh, 1230, I mean 1250 to um, almost a thousand. And then we have another bending stretching, it's like 900 and another one between 700 to 500. So this one has like three areas. They have 200 to um, 1,000, then 900, and then 600 to, no, sorry, six, no, seven, 400. 
and this is CMs minus one. Okay, so that is the area. And this one is different because it's terminal. This one is in the middle. And this one, you will get that from the, uh, from the vinylic in the area 20, 20, yeah, they have 27 to 31. This one, it will be 2700 to 3100. And it seems all uh, minus one. So that's all. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, this one messed up a little bit. Let me look how I can do that. It's all. Okay, I think now, now, okay. This one is for the first one, this one is for the second, this one for the third, and this one for the last. Okay. Um, any questions? No? No, oh, yes. Anyway, I will go again in this area because it's the same topic for the lab. Okay. So we will see you later at two um, for the lab um, meeting. Um, it will be shorter because I'm, I get most of the time for the class. Uh, but see you later at two o'clock. Um, can you check your direct message? I 